Okay. <clears throat> now, the title of the sermon this morning is Nurture and Admonition. Sorry, you might have got you excited that it's going to be like, ooh, this is a sermon on fighting the principalities of the darkness of this world. But uh, no, today, um, you know, I talked about roles of husband and wife last week. And, um, you know, I've, I've preached many a sermon on, you know, disciplining our children. Um, and I've, I've talked about the value of children. I want this, this sermon to mainly focus on the nurturing side of parenting, um, the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So I get the title from Ephesians 6, 4. It says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The nurture and admonition of the Lord. And I think it's interesting that, you know, the nurture is mentioned first, right? So because uh, I, I firmly believe, and I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me, that, you know, admonition and discipline and, you know, coming down hard on your children can only be very effective if they know they love you, right? If, if, or if, they, if, the, if they know you love them. Sorry, I think I worded that wrong. If they know that you love them, right? And it needs to be balanced with the nurture as well as the admonition. I mean, how many horror stories have you heard in, you know, fundamental circles, um, you know, of children, uh, of children being disciplined? Um, it's going too far. You know, children growing up, um, growing resentful of their parents, and, and that, is a, that is a real danger. That's like the other side of the spectrum, right? One side of the spectrum is that no discipline is going on, right? And there's no harsh penalties for, you know, infractions in the home. But on the other side, you know, because Christians nowadays, they just put their kids in the Christian school, put their kids in kids' church, put their, they have like no relationship with their children at all. Um, that children just grow up and, and the only thing that they know of their parents is when they're getting in trouble, right? And that ought not be the case. Um, so today I want to talk about the nurture and admonition of the law. Now, I apologize that maybe that, uh, you know, it's not, not as uh, relevant to maybe the people in this room today. But like I said in my prayer, you know, <clears throat> you know I think uh, anything uh, when it comes to Christianity and, um, you know, when I talk about any sort of practical topic, our mindset should always be, you know, maybe this doesn't apply to me today specifically, but we should always have the attitude of, you know, this is in the Bible. I need to know this wisdom because even though you may not have children of your own, you know, you may have friends that have children that may need your advice about how to go about things. You may have, you know, you may, you may be married, you may not be dating, but you may, can give advice to people that are, or, you know, you, or you know what to strive for so that when you think about one day being a mother or a father, you know, like, hey, this is what God expects. It doesn't come as a shock to you to, you know, what, what uh, God expects from parents. Now, I obviously do believe in spanking, you know, like, uh, you know, spanking I think is good. And, and, you know, I will touch on that just briefly in, in this intro that, you know, we don't want to go, like I said, the opposite direction where everything is just positive parenting, nothing is negative, there's no consequences. No, the Bible does teach that spanking is a right form of punishment and that it's a fitting form of, and it's an effect, effective form of punishment. Proverbs 13, 24, he that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him, chasteneth him be times. You've often heard the saying, you know, you spare the rod, you spoil the child, right? But the Bible has much stronger language. It says you spare the rod, you hate your child. And it's almost saying like you've forsaken them, like you have something against them, like you despise them so much that you are not willing to do what it takes to correct them. And sometimes it gets to that point. You know, you need, you know, different ways to discipline your children. And this is an effective way and a severe way of doing it. Right? Proverbs 22, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. See, so children do not grow up wise. You know, there's this, there's, it's funny that the world, you know, just teaches sometimes just completely opposite concepts to, to, to God's, um, you know, insight. And how many times do you hear that, uh, you know, parenting is just about guiding the child to just bring out who they are and, you know, they're, all, they're, they're naturally good and all you have to do is just like, you know, make that flourish and that's completely false. You know, like people are inherently, you know, they, we're born sinners. You know, we, we are allowed to just do what we want and just flourish in our natural <laughs> nature. We're going to become these tyrants and these brats and, you know, that's what we see in the world today. You know, I mean, 
when we were going to, you know, public school back in the day, I mean, it was already pretty bad. And like now it's just getting worse and worse. I mean, you see like, you know, the Zoom calls of schools and you're just like, I just can't believe that that is an actual classroom of kids. Like, you know, because back when I was in school, even the bad kids were pretty well behaved, you know, in a the sense there was a, there was a limit. But um, yeah, it's, it's getting pretty bad. But foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Right? But what we have to remember, you know, is we can't just take one side of this equation of this nurture and admonition. We can't just say it's just admonition, right? It's nurture and admonition. And we, we don't want to go one way or the other. There needs to be both. It's kind of like what's more important, you know, is grace or truth important? You know, it's like it's not a balance. You should just strive to do both as much as possible. That's how you get the balance. You don't want to compromise on one or the other. You, you strive for excellence in both areas, and that's the best way that you try and uh, get that balance. Okay, so three things when we talk about um, nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, number one, is first of all, I mean, you want to, we need to value our children. Well, we need to value not just our children, because, I mean, you know, maybe you don't have children yet. But just value children in general. You know, you value children. Like to, to today's day, we, we live in a society today where people do not value children. Now, not only is that detrimental to the existence of a society, right? You know, you need, a society needs to average like 2.2 children, you know, to, to just even be around long enough and not have this overburdensome, you know, aging population um, that is uh, happening on, on, a, on a diminishing population. But God wants us to value children so because they, they are valuable. You know, that's, that's the truth of it. And I think uh, a lot of Christians don't really internalize that. Now, how, how does this devaluing of children come across in culture, right? It's when people say, well, I'm going to wait until I have children. They, they say things like, I only want one child, two child. Oh, that's enough for me, right? Now, if I was to ask you how much money you wanted, would you put a limit on that? You'd say, well, okay, if I can just create money, well, why would I put a limit on that? You know, you just say like, so you can see that if, you were to, if somebody was to offer you something of value, you don't put a limit on that. Your attitude is, I'm gonna try and have as many of these things as I can, right? Now, within reason, because obviously, you know, there are, there are other factors involved, you know, in terms of health and, you know, other things like that, you know. And, and so I'm not, I'm not of the persuasion, like the Catholic Church and other fundamental churches, that uh, family planning is necessarily sinful. I think there are forms of birth control that are absolutely sinful, right, where they are actually causing silent abortions and killing children. But in terms of, you know, you know, separating up how frequently you give birth for health reasons and other reasons, I think there are legitimate reasons out there. But that's not, that shouldn't be used, and this is a matter of the heart, right? That should not be used to, to devalue, um, you know, what is very valuable and, and God puts in a very high value. And, and it's, a, it's a sad thing that Christians have taken on these values from the world where we will value career progression, we will value, uh, you know, le legacy in this world, we will value pleasures and experiences above the raising of godly children. It's a, it's a sad thing because, you know, I don't think that these things are more valuable. You know, Jesus said, you know, what shall I profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul, right? And, and, and as you know, people who are married and people have the ability to have children. I mean, they have the opportunity to bring up a new soul into the world. And for Christians to think that anything else is, you know, more valuable than that, it's, 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 it's a shame. And, and it is unfortunate. You know, that's why the Bible, um, you know, it talks about having children as being a blessing, not having children as being a curse. We'll, we'll look at some of these verses. In Genesis 1, verse 28, God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. You see how this was a blessing? You know, he created man and woman, and then he said, be fruitful and multiply. It's not, 
He created man and woman. It's like, oh, now like, you know, make your life miserable and burden yourself and, and restrict yourself from all these choices that you could have made that you decided to have children. No, it's, it was a blessing. Because why? Because it was more valuable than these other things, right? Be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Again, I said, you know, when we look at the blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy 28, it says, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground. What is that talking about? Like, you know, the, the fruit of the ground is blessed. It means it brings forth much fruit. So the blessed fruit of the body is that, you know, it's a, it was a blessing that, you know, you didn't have a barren womb. It was a able, you were able to bring forth uh, this fruit of the body. And opposite to that, Deuteronomy 28, 18, Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. And isn't it a sad thing, you know, today that God doesn't have to curse people. They're just like cursing themselves by like not wanting kids, you know. Um, and I'm not talking about people, obviously, that are in, not in a situation to have children. You know, this is, this, this is a different situation. Psalm 127, verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. And the fruit of the womb is his reward. Right? So it's a reward for, you know, obviously they're being married and, um, you know, having a good relationship with your wife and, you know, and, and we're rewarded with children. It's a reward. You see, it's not a burden. It's not, ah, you know, this is just an unfortunate circumstance of, you know, getting what I want, <laughs> you know, from a physical point of view. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. So notice here, you see, like what is the Bible encouraging here? It says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, right? So it is something that Christian godly men, godly men of God, should value having children, right? So are children of the, what does that say? Youth. You see how the Bible here is encouraging having children young. Right? Because they take time to obviously make. But, you know, a lot of people, how, how, what's the mindset today, though? The mindset today is, oh, before I get married, i got to go through, it's got to go through school, obviously. Then i got to go through uni, three to five years of uni. Then i got to do my postgrad, two of those postgrads. I don't know, they stay in there for like ages, right? Two postgrads. Then i got to work, you know, or then, no, then i got to travel for a bit, right? <laughs> Travel a few years, you know, sow my wild oats is just like encouraging fornication, usually. And then I got to work for a few years, and then you get into the, your career, and then you start realizing, okay, well, you know, I got to start progressing. And before you know it, you're 30 years old, you're 35 years old, and not married, no children. And then now it's hard for you to have children, you know, because when you're older, it's more difficult. So, you know, the Bible definitely encourages, you know, people to have children when they're younger. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies at the gate. See, look, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. So we talked about children being valuable, but also one aspect of having children, they're a weapon, in a sense. You know, because, you know, I'm sure all of us here are just as angry as I am about what's happening in this world. You know, and one way we can impact the world is that we raise up godly children and send them out into the world, right? But you've got to have children. You're only going to have children if you value children, right? So and part of the reason why I think, you know, people do not, you know, bring their kids up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, especially that nurture, is because, you know, they may not value them as much as they ought, you know, and it's just, you know, they, well, they have children, something they want to do, but, um, you know, they're not bringing them up in that nurture. So, first point is, value children. Value children. The Bible obviously talks about it being a blessing. We're commanded to be fruitful and multiply. Um, and, you know, we can use them, you know, or hopefully train them up to, to, to join the fight. You know, and you have that uh, advantage as a, as, a, as a parent in order to um, have that influence on them. Right? If you love them, you can train them to be more if effective for the Lord. Uh, hopefully they will make that choice themselves as well when they grow. <clears throat> now, number two. 
Number two is we got to love our children. That's the main theme of this sermon this morning. You love your children. Look what it says here in Titus 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So the part I want to focus on in this passage is to love their children, to love their children. So, you know, what is, what is love? You know, I think it's always a good reminder that, you know, us as Christians, we should not buy into the world's philosophies that love is just an emotion. You, know, you say, I love my children. It's like, oh, I love them so much. But you're, you're a terrible example. You don't live a godly Christian life. You don't know the Bible. You don't, you know, you don't do what's best for them. You, you allow them to just, you know, run amok and don't pull them up. And it's like, oh, yeah, I know I should spank them, but it's just so unpleasant. Oh, yeah, I leave my wife to do that. You know, just these sort of things, right? Then you've got to ask yourself the question, you know, do you really love your children? You know, because love is, a, is an action, isn't it, in the Bible? I love is, is something that you do for somebody else. You do what's best for them. You're putting others first. You're setting a good example, right? It's not just that emotional affinity. 1 Thessalonians 2. Look at what uh, Paul says here to the Thessalonians. He says, but we were gentle among you. And this is, you know, these principles obviously can apply to just any re relationship where there can be, you know, mentor to mentee. Um, look at what Paul says here to the people at the, in Thessalonica. He says, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? That this is Paul. He's a man, right? And some men, you know, some men are like, oh, you know, I'm a man. This all lovey-dovey stuff is for, for girls, right? Which is not true. You know, guys, even though, you know, we should be strong and stable and all these things that you would expect of masculinity, but part of being mas masculine is also, you know, being affectionate towards things you ought to be affectionate towards. I mean, think about God. I mean, is God just like that? You know, people get this idea, oh, masculinity is just, oh, I have no affection. It's just, you know, stonewall face. I mean, is God like that to us? I mean, is God and Jesus, are they not the perfect examples of masculinity? And do you get that impression from God that he has absolutely no affection? Of course not. It says here, we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, right? So even though he, he's saying like we are able to have, you know, and exude the sort of affection that you would expect from a mother breastfeeding her children, right? But he's saying, but we were like this to you guys, you know, as men. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, look at this, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. So if you value your children, you value them. He's saying like, hey, it wasn't enough for Paul in Thessalonica just to teach them something, teach them good doctrine. I mean, he could have just went to that church and just preached to them and say, hey, I gave you some good information. That's, uh, it's, you know, I've, I've done enough for you. Is that not enough? You know, it's like, it's like the attitude of some fathers these days. Hey, I put a roof over your head. I feed you, you know, got you in church. You go to school. Is that not enough? I've done my job. It's not enough. Right? This is what he's saying here, here is, hey, it's not just, he's not, I didn't just teach you the wisdom of God. He's saying here, but, I, but I also our own souls, it's like I poured myself into you guys. And that's how parenting should be too. My parenting should not only be discipline, instruction, but it's also that commitment, giving your, your life into these people to, to make them grow, right? And it's no different to, like I said, in any sort of, mentor-mentee relationship. Mark 9 here, look at what, uh, this is Jesus here. He took a child, set him in the midst, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them. And I just think it's great that, uh, you know, when Jesus is preaching here, he gets a child in the midst of him, and you can imagine that he's holding a child as he's speaking to them. And it just gives you this idea that, you know, Jesus is quite affectionate towards children as well. I mean, you know, in terms of he's holding him, holding this child and speaking. Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me, 
And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. So likewise, when Jesus talks about how you treat the brethren, that's how you treat him. You know, he's, he's applying that specifically to children as well. Like how we treat children is a reflection of what we think about Jesus Christ and how we treat him. John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name and he followed not us. And we forbade him because he followeth not us. Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. And uh, this is the bit I wanted to show you here in verse 42. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. So this gives you an idea that Jesus, loved, you know, the, like the song, Jesus loves the little children. He indeed does. You know, he cares about little children uh, and we ought to value them too. We ought to love our children the way Christ loves children. Look at Job 39. Job 39. Interesting analogy here, if you're not familiar with it, of the ostrich. And the ostrich in the Bible is um, pictured as, a, as, a, as a, like a dumb animal, not very wise, but also is used as an analogy of a sort of uncaring or uh, care, like a careless mother, right? Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in dust? And forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear. Because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifteth up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. And what does this remind me of if we were to put an ostrich Ostrich motherhood in today's day and age, you know, I would say that's like the career woman that, you know, doesn't breastfeed a child, you know, maybe has a child on point. I understand there's medical reasons why people do that, but, you know, some people, it's too inconvenient for them. So formula the child, put the child in daycare, you know, and, you know, but I would also extend it to just, to just parents that, don't care enough about their children's upbringing that they're just happy to just chuck them in the public school and then just get taught whatever rubbish. This is like here. It's like you're hardened against the young ones as though they're not even yours. It's like, it's like, the, it's like the, the Pharaoh's daughter when she takes Moses. She's like, take this child away and you know, nurse it for me. And when he's old, you can bring him back. It's like you, know, you don't want to be part of that you know, growing up process and that, and that affinity um, with the children. Um, this is how the ostrich is compared to, and um, you know, many mothers these days have this sort of ostrich mentality of bringing up their children, and they will choose career over bringing up their children. I remember I had this conversation with this uh, uh, successful sort of lady, one well, in the world's eyes, success, right? And um, she was telling me about her children, and I, was, I, I, remember, I asked her, I said, I don't know how you do it, you know, like how do you you know, how do you be like this successful executive and raise your children at the same time? And she said, oh, yeah, well, you know, you have to, you know, you've got to pay for daycare and your grandparents help out. And, and I, the saddest thing I, I think that came out of her mouth, and maybe she didn't think it was sad, she probably thought, it's like, it's like the lady that's like winning the Oscar and saying, oh, these abortions, like I couldn't have done it without this. It's a bit like that. It's, it's like, you know, well, you have to make sacrifices in order to make these and I just thought, oh man, like that's, that's just not worth it, you know? But I think that's the reality of it, guys. Like, you know, don't get it the world fool you that you can be like this successful career woman and be also a successful mother because being a mother is a full-time job, you know? And, and most of the mothers that are like, you know, tr single mothers, it's very difficult, you know? You, you, can't, you can't work full-time all the time, otherwise you're never taking care of your children. And those that are, generally aren't seeing their children that often, right? Or you have to depend on childcare. You have to depend on the public school and whatnot. So, you know, we don't want this sort of uh, 
culture um, amongst Christian women. God wouldn't want this either. Look at Lamentations 4. I just always find it funny. Ostrich is like the picture of an uncaring mother. What's, what's the picture of a caring <laughs> mother? Even the sea monsters. You see, it's saying like, hey, the sea, what are the sea monsters in, in the Bible? I mean, Leviathan is a sea monster. Right? And the Bible is saying like, hey, even something like Leviathan or these ferocious sea monsters, even they have the compassion of their children to draw out the breast to give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. <laughs> so isn't it funny that you know, the ostrich is deprived of wisdom, but he's saying, hey, even sea monsters, like, you know, ferocious, but they at least care about their children. Um, you don't want to be worse than a sea monster. Deuteronomy 11. So to love our children, you know, we obviously value them, but it means, you know, you, you look out what's, what's best for them, but it also means spending time with them. Right, spending time with them. Look what it says here. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they, they be as frontlets between your eyes. So you'll notice that this passage is very similar to Deuteronomy um, 6, isn't it? And ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up. So, you know, pe people often use this passage to uh, promote homeschooling. And, you know, I'm all for that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, be so, uh, you know, say that it's commanding homeschooling because, you know, it's not saying that you're the only one that's allowed to teach your child. You're allowed to get tutors and instructors and all that sort of thing. Right? So everyone's in different situations. But what I will say about this passage that I think what God would want us to strive to do is be involved in the lives of our children. Because if you think, if you're meant to be instructing them as you sit in your house and as you walk by the way and then when you lie down and when you rise up, I mean, isn't that painting a picture that you're quite, in, you're quite present in your child's life that it's sort of like from dawn until dusk, right? that you're there all the time, so then uh, you're speaking about God's word and training them, that you are present, you know, and that's one of the main advantages of homeschooling. Like when, you know, when you talk about the pros and cons of homeschooling, I think one thing homeschooling does that other types of schooling will never be able to achieve is the, just the amount of time that you spend with your children, you know, and, you know, I, I am against, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a sin, but I don't think it's wise, and I am against you know, putting your kid in a school for six hours of the day and just giving the best of the time of your children to somebody else, you know? I think, uh, you know, we sh you, know, you can, you can you know, contract services and what like that to, to get your children trained in certain skills and things like that. But I think even if you put them in a school, you know, I don't think you should be like the ostrich and just put your children in school and then you go do your thing and then somebody else is you know, leaving them in the dust like that. And not even yours, especially the way schools are now. Um, you know, if you're going to put them into some sort of schooling system because you need help and, and you like that school, and you know, a lot of schools like would love parents like volunteer and, and be part of that. So I think you should be as involved as you can if you may need that sort of help if you can't do it all yourself. So that your days, so thou shalt, when thou liest down, when thou risest up, verse 20, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon earth. I just think it's so interesting that God links training up the next generation, training your children, um, with you know, your days being multiplied in the land of your children, uh, land in the land, because you know ungodly civilizations don't last very long. Um, uh, Anastasia recently sort of pointed me to a study that was done. And I just found it was so like, wow, this is like so profound that this, it's called Sex and Culture. And it's, it's a study, uh, I just read sort of the conclusions of the study. But this, this, this uh, humanist um, sort of non-believer anthropologist, right? So an anthropologist is somebody that studies like civilizations and people. He went and looked at... Um, 86 tribes 
and like six, like 80 tribes and like six civilizations, I think that's the number, to see if there was a correlation between the sex within the culture, what is allowed within the culture, and how long that culture like lasted, like what, what happened of it, how, how much did it um, affect what he called human flourishing. So human flourishing is like the arts, the maths, the engineering, and things like that. And he had different categories, and I, and I, I can't call, recall them all off the top of my head, but he, he basically categorized them like um, how he determined flourishing, uh, I think, and then he sort of categorized what they, um, what, what the principles were in the society of prenuptial um, relationships. So it's like, you know, free sex, or you can have the sex before marriage, but it's only with one partner. Uh, or it was like, uh, you know, like what God would, you know, like abstinence before marriage. And, and then he also categorized um, like post-nuptial relationships, like monogamy, polygamy, monogamy till death, monogamy with, you know, one partner, but if you can leave for any reason, like no-fault divorce. And the interesting thing of this study is he found that the cultures that were like abstinence before marriage and one partner till death do us part were the cultures that flourished the most in human flourishing. And it was the cultures that allowed like, you know, free sex in the cultures and, you know, divorce whenever you want and, or, and no monogamy or polygamy or whatever. Those ones flourished the least, right? And then they sort of thought, why is that the case? And they think, well, maybe it's because stable families don't really bring up, you know, you know, thing you know it's like there's a lot of energy goes into you know establishing relationships and keeping all these relationships saying hey when you have a culture that's just really sexually driven it, it becomes a culture that's very inward and self-fulfilling rather than you know sex being about establishing a family and then people now investing in that family and the stability of a culture and it's just because more energy is about self-fulfillment it's no longer about you know, that energy is now in a, in a society going to other areas of culture. So it's just interesting. But you know one thing that he found, and that was absolutely like, like mind-blowing, he found that without exception, any culture that went, that started allowing this, you know, sexual promiscuity in their culture, like without fail, within three generations, that culture either no longer existed or it was taken over by a culture that didn't do that, right? So it's, 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 a, it's a study, you can go read it yourself, it's called Sex and Culture, it's by J.D. Unwin, and I just thought, wow. And that just, um, you know, just reflecting on that, I was, I, I, it always makes me think about, you know, why God has such strict laws around adultery, homosexuality, and bestiality. You know? And it's probably because of this reason that really the fabric of society is the family and the family is a sexual relationship and it has these issues. So anyways, I know that was a bit of a rabbit trail, but here it just, it just uh, makes me think about that, that you know, the way we train our children, it really does um, change you know, the, the way a culture will go. Maybe that's why God made it so important. And he's saying, hey, if you do do these things, you raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You're not, it's, this is not just uh, theoretical that your days may be multiplied. It's actually literal that if you want to be in this land for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, you better keep these commandments. Because if you don't, like J.D. Unwin's study found, in three generations, you're going to be taken over by somebody that, has, has more flourishing than an ungodly nation, right? So this is why I think homeschool, spend time with your children, and I will say this as well, you know, in our culture, you know, beware of the devices, you know? I mean, I say this to myself as well. I think all of us probably spend too much time on social media and YouTube and all that, you know, even during church, right? You know, when they shouldn't be, you know, you, even during church when your, your attention should be on the Word of God, you're still scrolling through your Facebook feed and all that sort of checking your messages. Uh, this is a problem in our society and it's a problem amongst parenting as well where, you know, you, 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 you miss out on some of the, you know, things about your children because you're just not paying attention. You're too, you're too, too worried about other people's lives and your own life. You know, the, your life that's happening in the front of your eyes, you know, and you care more about somebody else's life, you know. So that's a problem. Beware of it.
you know. All right, number three, train your children. Number three is train your children. We don't want to just value children. We want to just love our children, do what's best for them. Part of what's doing what's best for them is that we train them. Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child. So it's not discipline up a child in the way he should go. Right? It's not, excuse me, it's not just teach a child in the way he should go. It's train up a child in the way he should go. Now imagine, you know, you go to some training session, whether it's some sort of sport or martial art or anything, and you go to this training session and the instructor's like never there, right? And you're just, okay, it's left there, you come, you're expected to be there, but there's no instructor there. And the instructor just comes every now and then, and then he comes in and just knocks you over the head and tells you off that you're not doing it right. That's how some people parent, right? So we don't want parenting to be like that. So it's like, like parents get upset with their children with things that they haven't even shown their children how to do. Now I'm guilty of that too. But this is why I'm te teaching this morning to everyone here. I'm trying to want to change that culture, right? That when we train up our children, what does it mean to train? It means you've got to spend time showing them, instructing them, correcting them. You know, people know how to train their animals. You know, train their dog, positive reinforcement. It's not just negative, right? It's positive reinforcement too. It's praising your children. It's being enthusiastic about, hey, when they succeed about things. You know, and um, sometimes we, I think we lose that sometimes with older children. But younger children, I mean, it's, we're experts at it, right? I feel like it's like when a child, you know, starts standing up, we're like, hey! and everyone's like cheering on the child. But, you know, but we don't continue that sort of mentality as they get older, and we should. So train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So we have a great promise there that if we do take the time and the effort to instill these habits and these values into our children, they will still carry them with them when they're older. And, and all of us, we, we've experienced this. We know the power of things that we've grown up with that we tend to gravitate back towards it or we reflect on it when we're older and we remember these things. And we want to create that sort of upbringing for our children, but in a godly way. Because unfortunately, not all of us have grown up in godly cultures, right? And we have held on to things that we don't even realize we shouldn't do or things that aren't ideal, and we just value them. Why? Because that's just how we've grown up. So you can see the power of raising our, these culture and setting these habits in. And this is what this proverb is talking to. Mark 10, 13, this is Jesus again talking to a crowd of people. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. And said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and he took them up in his arms, and put his hands upon them, and blessed them. There's so much in here, but I just think there's so much insight here into what God or Jesus thinks about children. One is, you know, you have like the adults there probably going, Ah, oh, you know, you guys, children are being. You know, causing trouble, what are you guys doing here? But what's the attitude of Jesus? Hey, no, let, let them be around. He wants them around, you know? But that's why it's so sad to see in churches these days. What do they do with the kids? Put them in kids' church. Put them in, get them away because they're too distracting rather than have them amongst the church. I mean, when Jesus preached, he had them amongst the church. I mean, otherwise, how did he set one in the midst and pick one up? I mean, he's, I mean is that not a church service where Jesus is preaching and everyone's at attention? What's going on? But there's children there. Right? That's why churches should also have children amongst the congregation. Right? We don't, we don't want to perpetuate, and it's unfortunate in many churches, perpetuate this idea that, you know, when you have church and you have the preaching, that, you know, children are elsewhere. I mean, if it's good, they say it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. I mean, if, if you had the chance to bring your, you know, to go hear Jesus preach? I mean, wouldn't you want your children to hear him as well? And I'm not saying preachers are like Jesus, but I'm just saying like the Word of God. You know, having the Word of God being preached, having instruction taught, would you not want also to, to give children the opportunity to absorb what they absorb? And you don't know what they absorb, 
right? Well, sometimes we think, oh yeah, they're too young, they don't understand. Well, I think you got the wrong mindset because we don't know uh, what children absorb. And in fact, Jesus says here, you know, that the mindset that we ought to have as Christians in terms of receiving God's word should be emulated like a child receives that. Like we talk about the childlike faith. And that's why when we talk about training our children, you know, it's got to start young. Don't think, oh, you know, they're young. They don't understand it. You know, maybe they don't understand all the complex topics, but, you know, get them while they're that sponge that's just absorbing everything and their, and their character is being developed. Like that's when you want to impact their life. That's when you want, that's why, you, you know, you want your children, you want to be around your children to, 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 to rub off on them. I mean, look at how your friends rub off on you. That's what you want to do with your children, right? That's why I'm such a big proponent of, of homeschooling, right? I want my wife to rub off on my children. I want me to rub off on my children. I want you guys to be a good example so you rub off on my children too. That's why it's so important that we live a godly uh, lifestyle as well. So we see here, that's why you got to get them, you want to get them when they're young, as, as, as can. and the world, the world knows this. You, know, you don't think the world knows, you know, Satan knows that if he wants to, you know, destroy a Christian population and destroy Christian culture to get to the children. They know that. That's why they're trying to, like, take over the public schools and teach them all this rubbish, and then Christians go put their kids in that rubbish, right? And, uh, you know, don't let people discourage you when, when you say, like, oh, you know, you know, people will say to you, they'll say, oh, you know, what are you, brainwashing your children? You're just, like, you know, just enforcing your values on them? Yes! <laughs> I am! You know, I'm teaching my children the right values and I'm brainwashing them from your garbage because you know what, if I don't, they will. Right, so who, it's like, I don't want you brainwashing my children. I'm going to get to them before you do. So they, they're, they're like a bunch of liars saying, oh, you're brainwashing your children. That's what you want to do. That's what they're trying to do to our children. So it's just so deceptive and, you know, don't buy in it. Don't think, don't think bad because you teach, you know, if we don't teach our children how to think, you know, somebody else will. So, yeah, I, I, I understand maybe the sentiment that you don't want to just teach your children just to blindly follow things and just teach them what to think. But we need to teach them how to think, right? And if we don't teach them how to think, somebody else will teach them how to think. And, you know, over my dead body, is that going to happen, right? So, hey, it's important. And don't let people, you know, say to you, I uh, brainwashing them. It's like it's exactly what I'm doing. That's what everyone does. Everyone teaches their children. It's the stupidest thing that people say, you know. Second Timothy three, and that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't this Paul talking to Timothy, saying, "Hey, you didn't just get this when you were older. He's saying from a child, you've known the holy scriptures that were able to make thee wise unto salvation. So you need to do this." from when they're young, right? You know, Matthew 18. I'll skip over this one because this was just like another example of children being in the congregation there. Deuteronomy 31. Look at this. Now, therefore, write ye this song for you and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers that floweth with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them that this song shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed. For I know their imagination, which they go about even now before I have brought them into the land, which I swear. You know, Christians obviously always uh, talk about the impact of music. And I want you guys to internalize this, because I think sometimes Christians, they, they are a bit too lackadaisical about the music they listen to. They think, oh, yeah, Victor's saying it's powerful, it's powerful. And then, you know, then they just put their iTunes on in the car and they're listening to all this rubbish from the world. Look at what the Bible says here. You know, the song is a powerful thing. It's saying, hey, we, one way we communicate truths to our children is that, you know, you want them to grow up hearing these songs and it just becomes like they just know it, you know, because they've heard it so many times and there's these, these, these truths that they know. And, you know, 
we have songs from our childhood that don't leave us. So we need to be careful. That's like a double-edged sword where we want them to have these good songs, but we also don't want them to, to fill them with all these bad songs that they grow up with and they remember. So part of training our children, I mean, we can use this tool music to teach them these truths. We teach them these songs and then they'll grow up with them. And even if, God forbid, one day they get away from the Lord, Look at what the Bible says here. I just think this is so powerful. It says, hey, even if they get away, it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles are befallen them. It's like, think about the prodigal son story. That this song shall testify against them as a witness. You know, you want, you want some truths to stay with your children. You know, obviously there's that habit. But embrace Christian music. You know, it's not just about being spiritual and playing Christian songs in your house that your neighbors think you're spiritual. It's about, the, it's about, it's about enforcing, you know, what's the, what's the, reinforcing those lyrics, you know, those words into the people so that they, it, it's like a witness against them as they grow up. Now, this job of training the children is not just for one parent. It's both. Proverbs 29, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Now, and there ought to be some shame there when a child plays up. That, you know, it's a reflection, obviously, on the parents. And the Bible's saying here that particularly, right, child left to himself, it's the mother's responsibility to make sure that that child is being looked after on a daily basis, right, because the father's sometimes off working. Proverbs 31, verse 1. You know, sometimes we think that all the Proverbs, you know, all written by Solomon, all come from Solomon. But look at Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Isn't that, isn't that amazing that one of the Proverbs written, and a lot of people would say this is written by Solomon, that this actually was spoken by the mouth of his mother, right? And then made its way into the Bible. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an awesome thing that I think we should uh, really consider. Proverbs 31, she looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. So we train our children. But remember, we're talking about as well the, the way we train our children with the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, you know, we, we want to be motivated, you know, not only by its effectiveness in terms of being effective when we train our children, but also in, on the relationship side, you know, that we want a good relationship with our children. Um, you know, sometimes parents, they, they just like nag their children all the time. It's like, you know, wives may nag their husbands and, you know, this, this, this bad way of just trying to communicate and reinforce a message. And, you know, here you, you want to build that good relationship with your children so that you can impact their lives not only as a child but as an adult when they're no longer under your house and they can make decisions on their own and, and choose not to listen to you, right? You can't just say, do it because I told you, right? So that, those days are over and you need to have the wisdom to know I, I don't always have this control over them, so I, I need to influence them. And one way you're going to influence them is that you are pleasant to be around, Right? Like, if you're not pleasant to be around as a parent, then why would your children want to come back home? Why would they want to seek your counsel? Why would they want to spend time talking to you and sharing their, their struggles and challenges in life, seeking counsel? Look at this. This is the virtuous woman. Her children arise up and call her blessed. See, these children, you can see that the virtuous woman raised children and the children appreciate their mother. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. So there's the mother. Now going back to Ephesians 6 where we started, I think it's very important as well, you know, because we, we take it, it, it's sort of social, the social norm that mothers train their children. Right? But like I said at the beginning, affection should also come from the father and the father is responsible for the children being trained too. And ye fathers, Provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And ye fathers. So it's not that mum is the nurture and dad is the admonition or the other way around, 
right? You can see that the father here is commanded to have both the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Colossians 3 is the parallel passage. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, look, lest they be discouraged. Right? We don't want to discourage our children from doing right. So we don't want to provoke our children to anger. Um, I'll skip over Genesis 18, but this was using Abraham as an example um, that he will command his children as well. I thought he's, he's used as a good example of a godly father. Deuteronomy 4. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. We shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So the last point I want to say here is this training of our children, loving our children, it doesn't stop at the next generation, right? So this is why it's so important that when we bring up our children, it's not only in the admonition of the Lord because we don't want to risk distancing ourselves from our children, right? We want the nurture and the admonition of the Lord so that our children want to be involved in our lives and then it gives us the opportunity to be involved in our grandchildren's lives, right? Because how often is, you know, when, when people, you know, the, the parents and the children don't see eye to eye and it's, it's very hard to have an influence on the grandchildren. Your children might not want you to be involved in your grandchildren's lives if they don't appreciate your wisdom, right? So think about that as you grow in the Lord and, and the impact you may have on not only your own children, but the next generation as well. So value children, love your children, and train your children. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for... Uh, this time, thank you, our Lord, that we can um, be reminded from things from your word. I pray, Lord, that the parents um, in our church, would uh, this would be a good uh, lesson for them, a good reminder as well. And I uh, thank you, Lord, for the children that you have given us and pray that you'll help us to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.